whenever you're ready. Does anybody else have anything to share? We are ready. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. You don't. You're ready. I'm delighted to introduce Captain Tony Conrad, the newly appointed Chief of Police. He has served with the police department since 1995, was a member of the SWAT team and a field training officer in San Diego. We are eager to learn more about him and all the valuable services his office provides for our city to keep, as we are now considered, one of the safest in the country. So come on in, Chief. And good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Good morning, yes. All right. I get thumbs up if everybody can hear me, right? All right. Um, so, well, thank you for having me. Um, I, I want to start out by saying I absolutely love, one of my favorite things that I get to do as the police chief is meet with community groups. And I know some people might assume that, that that's tasking. Um, it's not. It's something, it's a great opportunity for me to come in, tell you about the police department, um, brag a, bit, a little bit about the great things that we do and then get feedback from you guys, um, our community. That's that's what's really important in 2021 in law enforcement and has always been important with Myriad of PD that we are partners with our community. Want to hear how you feel about the services we're providing, uh, want to tell you about what we're doing, and then get some feedback in case um, you may point something out that we don't know about, right? So we work for you, and so I love doing these presentations. Um, I've been... <clears throat> I was appointed chief back on December 30th last year. Um, so I'll just start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been with Murrieta PD for 18 years. Um, I worked for San Diego PD for nine years. So I've, I've been around in law enforcement for quite some time. I started my career back in 1995. Um, I've lived in Temecula in, in this valley uh, since 1994. So um, I have one son. He's a graduate of Murrieta Valley High School. He's in college right now in Oregon. Uh, my wife of 25 years is a teacher at Chevela Middle School. Um, so I've been around the community and kind of part of the fabric of the community for, for a long, long time. Um, I went to San Diego State, got my bachelor's degree back in the early 90s. I have my master's degree from Azusa Pacific. I earned that while I worked here at Murrieta PD. And, you know, been a law enforcement officer for a long time. And our last chief, uh, Sean Haddon, was our chief for seven years. And his time came to retire. Very happy for him. This wasn't something that I had planned, but um, they appointed me the police chief. I love the job and I've been doing it now for just over five months. So uh, just to talk a little bit and when we're all said and done, I can kind of go on my role about the department. Some of the things we're doing, give you a historical perspective about Myriad of PD for those of you that maybe uh, don't have that knowledge. And then at the end, we can, we can just open it up to questions. I, I do definitely want to hear some questions and feedback from you. So, so, you know, the way the police department is set up currently, well, the police department was started back in 1992 with 34 employees, uh, 25 sworn officers and nine professional staff. And today we're staffed with 101 uh, sworn officers and 60 professional staff. We have an, uh, a volunteer group not included in that number of over 40, and we have about 20 explorers, uh, which are, you know, high school, uh, early college aged folks that are, are basically volunteering their time for us as well. So in the building, you know, there's probably about over 200 people that work here now. So we've come a long way since 1992. Um, the culture of the PD is one very proactive, very close knit family within the PD and a very close relationship with the community. Um, proactive, professional, very progressive. So some of the things that you see maybe on the news on a nightly basis, those things, they're concerning for us to see, but we feel like we're already doing it the right way here at Myriad of PD. So, and the end result will be what you see in, in, in our safety rankings year to year, we're very, very safe. Um, we're always in the top five. Um, the relationship we have with our community, you see it through social media. So uh, some of you may not be social media active at all, and some of you might be, but the reality is, is Myriad of PD has on our five platforms over 100,000 followers, people actually looking at what we're doing every day on those platforms. So that's really the way in 2021 that we communicate with with the people that we serve through social media. So uh, very tight knit group work very closely with our community. Our dispatch center uh, is something that's changed the most over the last 
uh, year. Some of you may not know, but the city of Menifee decided to start their own police department. So uh, Menifee PD starts their own police department and they come to the city of Murrieta about a year and a half ago and ask, will you do uh, handle our dispatching services? Which in the world of law enforcement, a communication center is is an integral part of our operation, right? It, it's 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 basically the hub of everything we do. So actually serving the city of Murrieta and the city of Menifee is quite an undertaking. So we agreed to do it. Um, that took place or that that basically went live last July of 20, right in the middle of COVID. Uh, Menifee PD came online and we dispatch for them now. So of that staffing that I told you earlier, we have 35 dispatchers, including our managers and supervisors in our comm center up from 16. So a, a major culture change in our comm center. And I'm estimating that in when this year ends July 1, we'll probably be processing about 30,000 things a month. And when I say things, those are 911 calls, business line calls, formatting calls for service, sending our firefighters out. Um, our comm center not only serves Murrieta PD, but we serve the Menifee officers and Murrieta fire. So our dispatchers are cross-trained in all those disciplines. They have to handle what the Menifee residents want, Murrieta, and then the fire department. And we're also uh, a, a center that, um, that does uh, medical dispatching. So our dispatchers are trained to take a medical call and if you're not a medically trained dispatch center, what happens is that call is just immediately transferred. Now what happens is while we're in the process of transferring the call, the dispatcher is going through a pro QA questionnaire, working down through what is the exact issue medically going on so that we can get you better services in a more timely fashion. And we can actually start working or basically the patient or the caller helping the patient work them through. So it's almost like having a medic on the line that's actually a dispatcher. So we're now offering that service. So our dispatch center has become very, very busy. Um, lots of changes have occurred in the dispatch center over the last year. And um, very proud of that program right now. The comms center is, is probably one of the proudest things I have going for the department right now, just because of how they've responded to the request for service. Um, newer programs within the PD um, and again, these are things that you can probably liken to what you see on the news at night. Uh, we have a therapist riding in one of our cars and a dedicated officer that deals nothing. Uh, they only go to behavioral health calls. So that officer is dealing with those that are possibly homeless, people that are in our community that are struggling with mental health issues. We get an officer to that person to help out. And that officer brings with them a, a clinical therapist. So we can really start solving problems of people that have the mental, mental health challenges and get them the resources that they need right there from the patrol car. So that's a program that we've had going now for about a year and a half, two years. Excellent, seeing great results from it. Um, I've placed two officers out into the field along with patrol. So just to remind you, we have our patrol bureau. Those officers are handling calls for service every day. I have a full detective bureau that handles everything from a burglary to a homicide, have a traffic division, records division, our comm center. But then within those units, we specialize. So what I've done is, is place two officers in the field that are in a uniform like what I'm wearing. And they're going around handling calls for service that are domestic violence related only. And they have then tied into all of those resources within our community that help those that are the victims of domestic violence. So I have two officers that are fully trained to do that. And then ultimately what we're looking for is those two officers will become domestic violence detectives. So it's giving us more specialized um, service delivery and patrol and a lot more training for those officers. Um, <clears throat> our SWAT team uh, has been in existence for, for many, many years, all the way back to, to 1995. But we have also joined Menifee in that endeavor and we have renamed the team the Southwest City SWAT team, and we serve Hemet, Menifee, and Murrieta. So over 300,000 residents are served by that SWAT team. And it may come to your mind, well, what exactly does the SWAT team do? Um, that team is tasked with handling anything that's a critical incident on somebody that may be armed or a high-risk search warrant. People that live in our community that 
that may be heavily armed. We think there's going to be major resistance. We'd rather attack that problem with a SWAT team because they have the special training, the resources, the armored vehicle uh, to resolve that incident that a regular patrol officer can't handle. So we've expanded that team to serve over 300,000 residents. Um, and then the, the last team that we've started in the last, probably they've been in existence for about three years now is our community policing team. So we have three officers dedicated full-time they do not answer radio calls. Uh, they report to a sergeant that's dedicated full time and they answer or they handle all those quality of life issues that come up in the city of Marietta. Things that a regular patrol officer probably wouldn't be going to uh, or, or is not necessarily a radio call, but it's larger projects. You know, um, there's an issue in a particular neighborhood with a lot of different moving parts that involve code enforcement, city hall, different resources, maybe some criminal acts, some civil things they'll attack that problem as a team and, and deal with it. They go to all of our community meetings. They're in meetings like, like this one here. Um, they'll, they'll have a presentation that they can give to, to our residents. Um, they're experts uh, in a lot of different areas that are, are really specific to community policing concepts. So that's our community policing team. Um, I mentioned social media to you. We talked a little bit about the culture. Um, we came out of COVID. Um, we did quite well. I think 15 of our officers, that's our estimate. We don't know for sure. As you guys know, with COVID, some people were asymptomatic. We don't know exactly who had it, but I think probably about 15 of our officers and maybe another five to 10 professional staff, uh, did get COVID. Um, they all did very well. The city did a great job taking care of them. Um, thank God we didn't lose any of our professional staff or our officers or our dispatchers. Um, COVID was a, a, a really major concern for us just for service delivery. Wanted to make sure that there was always officers in the field taking care of um, all of you and that our dispatchers also can't really run our operation without a dispatcher. So we wanted to make sure that our dispatchers were also safe and healthy. So those precautions were put in place and, and the PD and the city overall actually did quite well because of the safety precautions put into place. Um, recently at the PD, uh, especially if you're all residents of, of the city of Murrieta, we've had an uptick in, in fatality accidents. So um, the city generally sees probably about three, maybe at the most four. We've had a couple of years of two fatality accidents. That's pretty normal for a city our size. We are growing, probably pushing about 120,000 people now. So to date this year, we have five fatality accidents. Two of them appear, uh, two of the five appear that there's going to be criminal prosecution on those. Um, that's a number one priority for me right now. Uh, you've probably seen our, our traffic motors out working the Clinton Keith, Calle de Osoro, Whitewood, and all the other major thoroughfares that come through our city. Uh, we're working that through, you know, enforcement and education. We'll put a lot of information out on our social media to our, our residents. Um, and a lot of citations are being written right now. So, um, a lot of people ask, why do I think that uptick? I've talked to my peers. I've talked to the captain over at CHP Temecula. We're kind of seeing this statewide, um, especially even here in Southern California, we talked to a lot of our peers and it's just maybe has some, some tie into COVID. Uh, we didn't have traffic for a long time. Many agencies in Southern California pulled their officers back on proactivity because of COVID. Now they're back out doing enforcement. And people are just driving at higher rates of speed right now until we get that enforcement, that education handled, which we're in the middle of now. Um, we're we're going to see that. So uh, we're attacking it. I think we have the right staffing here at Murrieta PD. We have enough motors to handle it. Uh, we have a big enough traffic division. We work very closely with the city's traffic engineer. Look at all the light cycles and, and everything that you probably read on social media or you hear in the news. We're addressing it uh, with best practice. So education and enforcement right now for traffic. That's about the end of my presentation, just on kind of what's happening right now at the PD and a little bit about me. Does anybody have any uh, specific questions or anything at all? Chief Conrad, I just yes. want to tell everybody about your Citizens uh, Police Academy which mm -hmm. is just fantastic. I took it and you go in depth on all of these different divisions that you have. 
and it's what's uh, very much a learning experience. And I'm especially impressed with your dispatchers and all that they do and your interaction with the school children. Anyway, mm -hmm. your police force is wonderful and I encourage everybody to take that academy. Thank you for your report. No problem. So the Citizens Academy, I'm trying to get that started back up this summer. Uh, we just want to make sure everybody's safe. Uh, we don't have the ability to ask the folks, you know, that come to the Citizen, Citizens Academy, whether they're inoculated. Uh, sometimes people will, will volunteer that information to us, but we're working through the protocols to get Citizens Academy back up and running. It 100% will happen eventually. And that program is phenomenal. We hear great feedback. As far as our schools, um, school resource officers, so everybody knows, we assign an officer to all three of our high schools full time. They're basically start at that high school eight in the morning and they don't leave till three or four in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. Our expectation of those officers is they know every every student on that campus. They're basically the mini police chief for that high school campus and Everything that goes on from, you know, potential narcotics to discipline to making connections with kids that are positive. Um, that's what that SRO does. And then yeah. we have a whole number of other officers that are assigned to the middle schools, the elementary schools. We have a corporal <laughs> that's a juvenile services corporal that does nothing but investigate crimes, run all of our juvenile programs. And we have a very, very close relationship with the school district and are talking to them all the time about the most important asset we have in our community, which is our youth. So Murrieta PD has always been really tied in to, to, to our, our students in this town and make sure that we're getting them everything that they need. And um, thank you for, for reminding me about that. That's a really important program. Well, it was. <clears throat> you mentioned, uh, you said the number of that you would be probably taking 30,000 calls over what length of time? Yeah, uh, sorry, that's, and it's not just calls, but about every month, I look at them as tasks. So m many people will look at call volume, but call volume comes in a lot of different forms. So in the comm center, we get 911 calls, we get 911 transfers, we get business line calls, and then we get calls that come in on the business line that we need to transfer to another department. Mm -hmm. Every dispatcher also then handles an, a medical, medical emergency through the emergency medical dispatching. That's a whole nother task. Many of them uh, are creating calls for service, which is a whole nother task. And then many of the dispatchers are creating proactivity that's occurring from the officers. So an officer says, I'm out on a traffic stop. That requires a dispatcher to go into the system, run the plate, put the officer out. Everything that they would do on a regular radio call, they now have to do it on a proactive pedestrian check, traffic stop, whatever it might be. When you take all those things, they do that about 30,000 times a month for oh about 300, 360,000 tasks a year. And I think it just helps all of us to kind of wrap our head around how busy it is in the comm center. Um, the the kind of normal stat statistic that you'll see from from most chiefs is well how many calls for service do we take? But I like to really break that down for the community and well, what is a call for service? What exactly <laughs> is a dispatcher doing when they're working? Right. And and it equates to about three hundred sixty thousand things a year. Wow. Okay. Uh, also, I was going to ask. Uh, about the high school. Now, I know because of the last year and a half and COVID and all that, it hasn't been possible, but do they have some sort of an organization for up and coming uh, law enforcement students that would um, act in conjunction with whoever that officer is on campus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have that. Uh, our officers teach in that program, and that's run out of the Office of Education. It, it's mostly driven by uh, the school district. So there's classes that you can take at the high school that are very specific to law enforcement, and our officers teach in those classes. And then the other thing we're doing is, is our Explorer program has really ramped up over the last five years, really successful. Uh, they just had a competition this past weekend where they, they did amazing Explorers are just younger folks that want to get into law enforcement and they go to different events. 
number one, they handle a lot of service for us here. So the city birthday party, you're going to see explorers there, right? Running traffic control and things like that. But they also train physically and mentally to go to a variety of events all over Southern California and compete against other explorer programs to hone their skills. Ultimately, what we want to do is get them hired by an agency, if not us, somebody else. We have one of our explorers working for San Diego PD, one working for Dallas PD, several working for the sheriff's office. And so ultimately, we want to get them into law enforcement, kind of nurture their career path. And just recently in this next budget, I've asked the city to give me two cadet positions. And a cadet is basically a part time. I'm in college. I want to be a law enforcement officer. Uh, but I need to make some money and we can give them a little bit more responsibility here at the PD. Um, they only have a certain period of time that they can be a cadet. You can't be a cadet forever. And then I kind of look at it as our farm league, that that's where we can really test them within our environment, really hone their skills for the city of Murrieta and Murrieta PD, and ultimately offer them a job as an officer when they're done being a cadet. So that's another path that we have to get uh, law enforcement officers hired by our agency. So that's kind of an internship then, then. It's basically a paid internship. That's a great way to look at it. Yes. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about how you use volunteers? Yes. So um, when we when we get volunteers that come come in and join us, um, we look at their skill set from whatever. Many times they've had an entire career and they're extremely successful folks. They've been CEOs, financial officers. They've run their own businesses, extremely organized and talented, and they want to give back to the community. So we just find whatever niche we can get them in here at the PD, whatever job it might be. Many times they might be reviewing some documents for us. They might be doing some financials for us, or they may be interested in going out in the field, doing vacation checks, checking on parking violations, doing extra patrols. They're the eyes and ears for us. Many of them are in the station and never want to go out in a car. And we find plenty of jobs for them here in the station. And a lot of them, of course, want to get out in a patrol car and drive around. They get a radio. We give them some training. And then they basically will just come on and, and come on the air and, and advise us, hey, this is happening at the corner of walk and don't walk or I'll be out on a vac vacation check. Um, I tell my parents, they, my parents live in town here, Murrieta, and I tell them, hey, when you go out of town, just call in for a vacation check. Somebody will actually drive by your house. Now, when we had the volunteers paused because of COVID, it was an officer doing it. But many times we have a volunteer go by and if anything looks suspicious, they call out uh, an officer. They may talk to some of the neighbors, right? Just more eyes and ears checking on your home. And you can put your own phone number into the call and, and somebody can reach out to you and say, hey, I, I did a, a vacation check of your house. It all looks great. And it, it gives you some peace of mind when you're out, you know, on, on your trip, trying not to worry about what's going on at home. That's a service that we offer and the volunteers are a big part of that. I have a question. Tell us, we've been hearing a lot more on the social media about the homelessness in the area. Is mm -hmm. it just being talked about more or is, are you seeing an increase in that? Not necessarily seeing an increase. I think we're seeing, I think we're seeing the problem all over Southern California. Um, we're not necessarily seeing an increase in Murrieta. We keep pretty close tabs on, on those that are homeless uh, in Murrieta. We do a yearly count. We work very closely with City Hall. So really our homeless problem is mostly um, driven by City Hall. We have uh, Brian Ambrose that works at City Hall that's really dialed in on, on our homeless problem and the, and the resources that we can bring to these people. On our side, on the PD, I attack that problem with the community policing team and that behavioral health officer. Uh, and we, we decide what's the best approach. Um, we do have a stance of zero tolerance for you know, narcotics, um, warrants for their arrest. If we run into somebody that's homeless and there is a criminal issue aspect to it, we do handle that. Uh, we don't ignore it, but I also like to tell the community and, and I kind of brag about the officers when the officers uh, do handle that problem, they're the first one at the jail when that person gets released to offer resources and a business card and say, Hey, let's, let's get you some help now that we cleared up that warrant or we took care of that criminal issue. These are the things that I can offer you and where we can get you placed. 
So lots of resources in the county. We wish there was even more, but what's out there, we have it at our fingertips and we try to offer it to our homeless population um, every time we, we run into them for whatever reason. So, but I don't necessarily see an uptick. I just see it all over Southern California. Thank you. Speaking of that, have you seen more uh, people being released from jail recently or with some of the changes they've made on the um, sentencing and that kind of thing? We've been seeing that for quite some time. Um, AB 109, the different propositions, 47 and 57, changing um, criminal exposure for a variety of different crimes. Um, we have a, a, a fairly aggressive uh, sheriff in our county, um, but even the sheriff, there's nothing we can really do about the state mandates that come down. Um, our policy in the city of Murrieta is uh, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a felony, they're going to get booked. But in the city of Murrieta, if it's a misdemeanor, they're going to get booked. Uh, we have a, an informal policy that if an officer makes a misdemeanor arrest for that person not to get booked at jail, they have to have a supervisor's authorization for that to happen. So I tell the officers all the time, don't worry about what's happening in Sacramento. There's nothing we can do about legislation. We're not elected officials. We're here to enforce the law, uh, keep the peace. This is what our community is asking for. So when we make an arrest, generally that person goes to jail. Whether they're uh, released four hours later, what they're ultimately charged with by the district attorney, it's kind of out of my purview. Um, has that become, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's less exposure for criminal um, uh, acts that occur in, in the state of California. Clearly there is. Uh, there definitely less exposure, uh, less jail time, uh, but that's just, that that's the laws that have been passed. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I, uh, excuse me, Chief. I have a, I have a comment. Um, I'm retired uh, fire captain with Los Angeles County Fire Department, and uh, we dealt with police on virtually every call, and it just became coworkers. And so, um, at this point in my life, I still feel when I see a police officer that they're a coworker, and I approach them and I talk to them, and and I encourage this group to do that to get out there and speak with the officers in the street because. Uh, these people are just solid people. They're just like your neighbors, your sons, your daughters. Uh, and they're out here to, you know, make our world better. And uh, I encourage you not to feel intimidated, but to go out there and, uh, and talk to them and just see, uh, get their thought process and see what's going on. Cause they're all great people. Thanks for, um, thanks for pointing that out. And I appreciate that. And thank you for your years of service. Um, I couldn't agree more the the narrative that you see, uh, it's just not true that the, some of the finest people I've ever met in 27 years are police, firefighters. They're just really good people. They coach in this town. They shop in this town. They raise their families here. They care about their kids. They're connected. They make connections with the community. If few and far between uh, will you find um, bad first responders, despite what you hear on the news. And I can tell you right now, the first responders that work here at Myriad of PD, they're the first ones to tell you, we don't like bad cops. We don't want them working here. We don't agree with anything that you, that they may be doing. And there's a variety of different, you know, cases across the country that, that if you did comment or you did uh, speak with one of the officers, I'm sure they'd give you their opinion. And you're going to hear overwhelmingly, no, we don't like bad cops. We like it done the right way. Um, and we also need, you know, the reality is we do have to hold some people accountable that are doing criminal acts and that's what we do, but we do it in a very professional manner. And, um, so thank you for bringing up that comment, sir. I couldn't agree with you more. The narrative that you hear on a daily basis, it's not true. Speak with some of these people and you'll find they are fine, upstanding citizens, um, that are an absolute joy to speak with. So. I have family in law enforcement and in fire protection as well. And <laughs> I agree, good people, but I want to thank you. I live in the Spring Knolls of the Knolls Manufacturing yes. Homes, and you guys are always so responsive to anything that we ask. Anytime we have had a call put in, you're here immediately, and 
your services are greatly appreciated in our community. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, one other thing I wanted to point out, I think I have to go back in the personnel files and double check this number, but I'm very close. We just hired our 25th or 26th person here at Murrieta PD that went to a local high school, Vista, Murrieta Valley, or Mesa. Not all officers, many of them are officers, but professional staff as well, dispatchers. I think it's, it's so rewarding to see these people grow up in this community and they want to come back and work for the city. They want to come back and work for the PD. They want to serve as law enforcement officers right here, where they grew up, where their parents live, their siblings. And if you want to talk about community policing concepts, it really doesn't get any better than that. These people actually grew up here and now they're giving back to their community. And that's why I hear comments like that from citizens that you guys are so responsive. Well, that's what they, that's what they want to do. That's what they signed up to do. So it's what we expect, but I think that's kind of a myriad of PD culture and that we have, you know, 25, 26 of those folks working here now is, is, is just awesome. Love to brag about that. So. Do you still work closely with uh, the trauma intervention program? We do. We just had, uh, is it Magda? Uh, sorry. I'm, a lot of names come through my head, but she just came into our supervisors meeting and we went over tip. We would like to have the new sergeants hear what tip uh, offers. And uh, so, yes, work very closely with them. We came to Marietta in 1982 and we were in on the beginning of the police force. And it's just been wonderful to watch it grow and how wonderful all the officers are and friendly and as you say, community responsible. It's, we're just very proud of our police force. Thank you. I, I really think the department, um, our goals and, and our mission really needs to be driven by you guys. And so I think if that was how every police department in this country looked at it, um, you would see a lot less negative narrative about law enforcement. But the reality is, is that we serve you. This is your community and we want to police it exactly how you see fit. Um, so I think that started back in 1992. I really do. And, and here we are, you know, in 2021 and we're still pushing that, that culture. And that's one of my uh, biggest responsibilities as the police chief for however long I'm here is to make sure that culture stays intact. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Lila Lorenz, and I wanted to say to you, we lived in, I now live in Hemet, but I lived in Murrieta from 1996 to 2016. And before we moved to Murrieta, when we retired as African-Americans, we went to the police department because we wanted to know what the culture was. And I want to tell you that only two places, and we've lived all over the country, only two places that we ever lived that we never felt harassed, we always felt safe, was Corte Madera, California, and Marietta. <laughs> love that, thank you so much. I love to hear that. Um, I love your name too. I wish I wish my eyesight was better. It's Leela. Leela, right? Yes. Um, just so you know, when Chief hadn't started this, but I continue it, and it's probably one of my most enjoyable. Um, uh, we meet every other month, and we've been meeting by Zoom. I'm looking forward to when we can meet in person. But one of my most enjoyable community meetings was with Pastor Oliver of the NAACP uh, branch number 34 out of Lake Elsinore. But he has been such a great resource for me. Because I want every perspective that there is in the community, you know, um, I think that's really important. I think it's important that your police department properly represent your community, the different cultures and diversity in the community, I think are, are important to be represented, especially by law enforcement. And so I appreciate that comment. And please know that continues. And, and I speak with Pastor Oliver and his entire staff every other month. And love talking to him. And he, I run all kinds of stuff by him. I'll, on our one of our Zoom meetings recently, I just asked him, hey, what is your opinion on the Chauvin trial? How did you look at that in Minneapolis? 
I want to get his perspective. I know mine as a law enforcement officer, but perhaps being in this industry, maybe, maybe I'm biased by groupthink, right? I'm around cops all the time and I've been a cop for 27 years. How does Pastor Oliver look at that? How does somebody else in our community look at it? I want to get all those perspectives so that I can understand. Um, but I appreciate your comment. Thank you for that, Lila. I would like to add to that. Unfortunately, with the other side of that, my multiracial children, um, I've been here since 96. My husband was black. Uh, we raised our children since then. I, I had a family or two that didn't care for the color of my children when we were young. Um, but that's changed now. And even going to the grocery store, my kids get asked whether they can pay for their groceries. Um, they get called offensive terms at their jobs, at drive through uh, They get told to go back to Africa. Um, and I see SS and Nazi swastikas on arms of men constantly. And it's to the point where I would like to leave. So I find that during the past five years or so, that Muriet is not the place that I once thought it was. And that's my impetus for being here with the friends of Murrieta today was to meet you and to get to say that. Um, it's not the San Diego transplant that my husband and I wanted to, to raise our children at. Um, It's not the place where I want to spend my retirement. Now being widowed and having um, children and you know possible grandchildren come here, I wouldn't want them here. And I feel like I'm stuck in a place where I don't want anyone of a multiracial background to come after the past several years of rhetoric and political divisitude and the Chauvin trial. Um, I've found myself unwilling to even think of calling the police. My children are not white. And my bias towards police has changed because of that and because of the racial attitude that I see around here. And it's unfortunate how quickly divisiveness can change one's mind. Yeah. I find that the anger that I see in driving, it's, it's coming from somewhere. It's coming from frustration. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the pandemic and people's, people's lives such as they are, but they're putting it to their scapegoat to get on something. And mm -hmm. a lot of it gets scapegoated on whatever the, the narrative is of the day. And sometimes that gets attached to race. And sometimes that gets implanted on an arm new tattoo based on a group, an ideology that they feel like scapegoating it on. But it's happened quickly. The change has happened quickly around here. Um, I know you feel that somewhat when you walk around and you see the mood and, and you talk to people and you, you hear it in the air after a while. It may come up every once in a while when you talk to a certain segment of population. But as you talk to kids, make sure, make sure that you're working towards unity and not divisiveness and that that's always a talk that you're having at the schools um, because they're getting something from home. Mm -hmm. And when schools and police and community members, when schools are talking, it's got to come with that constant message that you are someone that they can trust and have faith in that has to be rebuilt it's not automatic 
And even though yeah. there is a huge <clears throat> population of BIPOC and POC here, we see media and faith has been ruptured. And please don't forget that, that the children that are here may be seeing a whole lot more than what you're going to get to hear about because mm -hmm. they may not be telling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see that too. Uh, I hear you. Um, Thank you. I, I, I feel, I feel uh, some of the things you're saying, I don't know if they necessarily came out of the pandemic, if they came out of the last, you know, several years of, of the divisiveness that was happening in, in politics, but we talk about it as a staff all the time, especially my closest staff, like my captains. And just more on a personal note, you know, we, we have a lot of conversations about, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around. People can't just agree to disagree anymore. Right. So people unfriend each other because um, my politics are slightly different than yours. So I don't like who you voted for. So I'm never talking to you again. I see that in my own personal life. Um, I'm seeing it here in the community. Um, I just turned 50 years old. So I, I'm kind of like, you know, getting to that point in my life where I'm reflecting back on, on those things. And police officers are, are, they kind of become experts in human behavior uh, when they've, when they've been an officer for a long period of time. And it's just kind of like so disappointing for me over the last year and a half to two years. And, and a lot of stress comes out of the pandemic and everything, but to see that behavior. So I hear what you're saying. Um, I hope you don't experience that um, from uh, your myriad officers that serve you. Um, they are diverse. They, we teach them to respect everybody's opinion. The, the word unity uh, comes to mind. Um, I do, would never want you to be afraid to call the police department. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that because we are there to help you and uh, we serve you. And, but I hear everything that you're saying and I'm doing everything I can on my end. Um, I will tell you, police officers feel a great burden. Uh, because the way that our social values go, uh, many times people look at the police as to, well, you're, you're in charge of that, you know, fix that. And it's, <clears throat> it's a lot for a police officer to carry that burden. So when we do get in front and when we do get in front of kids or I get in front of a community group, uh, I'm not going to hold back how I really feel. And we want to serve everyone uh, of all different races, religion. We don't, we, we, we don't want to, I try to tell the officers all the time, take the politics out of it. You're advocates for victims. I don't care what walk of life they come from. We are victim advocates. We're actually not suspect advocates, people that victimize others. That's for somebody else's job or role to take care of. I think people should be held accountable. Um, I don't want to see people uh, victimized. So we look at our mission statement. We look at our vision statement and, and everything that you just talked about reflects in that. And that's how we make our decisions. So um, thank you for saying that. I hear you. Um, I, see, I see very similar uh, to what you're seeing. I don't walk in your shoes, so I don't know exactly how, how you feel about it or what you see every day. But I also see those tattoos and I see that kind of divisiveness that, you know, I'm going to tell you how I feel uh, based on your race or where you come from. So, Well, I appreciate it. And as a teacher, I, I commend you for doing everything that you can, because I do see that burden and it is yours. And as mm -hmm. a teacher, I asked for mine and as a police officer, you asked for yours and mm -hmm. it comes to task. So it's part of our, our, uh, part of what we went for as the job and it's, it's a big one and it's part of what gets us their halo at the end. So. Absolutely. Uh, Chief, is there a ecumenical group of pastors that represent the various churches that you're involved with? We have a, a, a chaplain program. Um, I have three chaplains. Um, I meet with them monthly. Um, we use them uh, really as a peer support for our officers and for the community. So we tie them into people that are suffering in the community as well. And trying to take the religious aspect out of it, um, they're just really experts in empathy and caring for people. And so that's 
I think that's answering your questions, but we have a, a chaplain program that's, it's part of our volunteer corps, but very important to us talking to the chaplains. I would say I'm probably talking to a chaplain about something, either a call or something internal to the PD probably once a week. So in constant communication with them, and then they come out and ride with our officers, pretty much know most of the professional staff because they're also there to, to support the officers and some of the things that the officers are dealing with. That's, that's hard to see. Um, we're definitely finding the old school way of doing law enforcement was you kind of pushed all that stuff down, never talked about it. Okay. Um, and then that's why you have such high suicide rates in law enforcement, have exponentially high suicide rates uh, in law enforcement across the country. So what I'm trying to push is, no, let's let's get out in front of it. Let's talk about it. Let's debrief it. Let's get a counselor involved. Let me have a chaplain reach out to you. Um, the officers would probably never admit it to me, but I know that that it's very helpful for them and and it's a good thing moving forward. Most of your progressive law enforcement agencies are doing that uh, nowadays just to try to knock that suicide rate down for law enforcement. I just was thinking in terms of numbers, you know, you do a lot of stuff with schools because of the numbers involved there. And also because that's our youth coming up. But uh, in Murrieta, there are some really large numbers of, uh, of big churches that involve a lot of people. I just wondered if they had some kind of a council or something that, that you were involved with. Guess not. My chaplains tie into probably the biggest is Calvary right now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's usually where we do our chaplain meetings is at Calvary. So. Okay. Any other questions, guys? I'm open to, to anything. You can see I don't shy away from um, I want to answer your questions and have open discussion and dialogue. Um, anything else that uh, you guys have concerns about or that you want answers to uh, programs or things PD is doing? In, in your opinion, is carrying arms helpful or detrimental for people's security? Uh, we have a, a, a carry concealed weapon program. Um, uh, that we that we found to be very successful. Uh, I taught active shooter and was the lead instructor here at the PD for many, many years. Um, so I guess in terms of making a community safer, if those that are law abiding citizens are carrying firearms, if you would like my opinion on that, it would be I believe it is. Um, so, however, um, that comes with um, got to check a few boxes on that. So uh, we don't want anybody carrying a firearm. Um, we we respect the right for you to carry the firearm, but here at Murrieta PD, uh, I require a psychological evaluation and a very detailed background before I issue that. Some states just CCW is just, which is stands for carrying a concealed weapon. That's just authorized. So um, I go to Arizona and there's people walking around all over the place with a handgun on their hip. That's not the case here in California. However, a police chief does have the ability to issue a CCW, and we do, uh, and we found the program to be very successful. And I do believe if you if the right people are caring, I do believe it makes a community safer. Dan, I hope this recording can be sent out to everybody that we can possibly get in touch with. This should be go viral. You guys have any other questions? I guess not. <laughs> no, but thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> really You're to welcome. You. We're really thank happy you. to your coming. We have learned so much, you know, what you said. And we feel so lucky having you in charge of this marvelous program for our city. Thank you, Chief, very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure doing it. And uh, you guys all have a great day. Thank you, you so much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Conrad. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.